So uh, today we'll be hearing from our uh, soon to be retiring uh, visitor services supervisor, a well known love and of course, Jim. And he will be, <laughs> don't show any cookies there now. So he will be, <laughs> he'll be, I don't, I don't know, I'm sorry, I didn't want to make a joke on your cookies, but he will be. He will be uh, speaking on the history of nativism uh, in America, and I'm sure he will have a little time in it as well uh, tomorrow. So on that subject, on that particular subject. Uh, so, and of course, uh, feel free to help yourself to refreshments. Yeah, you know, ready. No need. Uh, so I uh, present to you now, Jim Boshin, who will give you his uh, presentation for today. All right. Uh, it's a subject that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, not exactly a fun subject, it can be uh, downright ugly, but uh, for some reason I just find it uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, I've been not just reading and studying on atheism for 30 odd years, but also, as you can see, collecting, collecting books, uh, and including a number of antiquarian books, which was a hobby of mine for a while. And uh, this was one of the topics I covered. So in the process of going through uh, some of the books that uh, represent certain, uh, or that interpret certain periods of time in the history of nativism, or that actually represent nativist ideas, um, uh, put you know, between covers and book. Um, now I'm not quite as organized as I would like to be, uh, and I have actually two sets of notes that I'm going to be following. One from a, a talk I did on nativism about 25 years ago, um, which I just uncovered this morning, along with, believe it or not, um, transparencies yeah. that went along with it. Now, we no longer have an overhead projector, so I can't show you my transparencies, except by uh, uh, passing around some of the uh, paper, paper copy versions of the job I'm doing. Um, and like you said, Rich, I'll be talking about local aspect, but also uh, regional and national aspects of nativism, and um, uh, actually probably spending more time on certain aspects of it, uh, like local manifestations, and also the anti-Catholic aspect of nativism, which was one of my focuses in, in study. Um, but of course, it's certainly by no means limited to that, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, just to talk about the term, nativism, uh, meaning, you know, prejudice against people who are not native-born Americans. Um, so if you're born here, um, you're okay. If not, you've got a problem with it. Um, it, it. The subject kind of overlaps with racism, and there are times when they uh, amplify each other and times when they're not, because you know, obviously, African Americans who were born here have been subject to uh, terrible discrimination for hundreds of years, but we wouldn't call it nativism because for generations they've been born here. Um, so, but there are other times when nativism and racism go together, such as in the anti-Chinese hysteria in the West in the 1870s and 80s. Um, so it's it's kind of a mixed history that overlaps and separates and comes back. Um, so uh, it started in the colonial era here um, when the vast majority of the colonial settlers from England were Protestants, most notably here in New England were the Puritans and the Pilgrims. And uh, you know, the Puritans and the Pilgrims were dissenters from the Church of England because they didn't think the Church of England had gone far enough in rejecting the Roman Catholic Church and its ways. So the Puritans and the Pilgrims, in a way, were kind of extreme uh, Protestants. And they remained the majority of the population of New England as, as late as the 1840s. Um, the rest of the uh, colonies along the coast of the King Original States were not as homogeneous as Massachusetts. Um, so you've got uh, Dutch in New York, Germans in Pennsylvania, uh, Scots and Scotch-Irish, French Huguenots, French Protestants, um, and even some Catholics in Maryland. Um, but when John Adams went to the, uh, uh, was it the Constitutional Convention? No, the, in, the Philadelphia in 1776, what do they call it? Continental Congress? It's not the Congress. To uh, write the Declaration of Independence and decide on all that. 
Uh, he met Char uh, was it Charles Carroll, uh, who was a representative from Maryland. That was the first Roman Catholic John Adams had ever met. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can imagine that if you don't meet anybody, you can have some pretty uh, negative preconceptions, negative preconceptions about somebody, and it will be reinforced by every societal influence around you. Um, so that's, that's where we were uh, leading up to independence. Um, also during that time, uh, we fought a couple of wars against France. Um, what we call the French and Indian War was actually part of the, the Seven Years War between England and France, which is a worldwide conflict. Uh, but in one of the earlier wars in the 1740s, uh, New Englanders who were fighting under the British went up to Nova Scotia to fight the French up there, because Canada was still French and the maritime colonies were still French. And when they were up there, uh, they went to a Catholic church and sacked it and ruined the altar and stole the cross and brought it back to Boston in triumph because they had defeated those nasty French Catholics um, and succeeded in some level of suppressing the, the threat of Catholicism uh, in New England. Um, Oh, and, and finally, one of the uh, colonial era aspects of this is when, af after the revolution, when, no, this is leading up to the revolution, the Quebec Act, Correct. one of the intolerable, yes. uh, say that three times back, intolerable acts uh, that the parliament passed in the 1770s in the immediate run to the revolution. But well, one of them was the Quebec Act, which allowed religious freedom for Catholics in Canada, which England had just conquered. And that was seen in the colonies as one of the intolerable acts because there could be religious freedom in Catholics. You're a Protestant uh, country, uh, as are we, so uh, how dare you? Um, so that's kind of the added general attitude about Catholicism um, amongst most people in the at the time. Now, after uh, independence, immigration begins to pick up. And some of the earliest immigrants are Irish and indeed Irish Catholics. Um, is before the potato famine, there were other lesser famines and just general poverty uh, in Ireland that people wanted to escape from. So there's Irish immigrants coming in the 18 teens, 1820s, etc. And their reception is not exactly warm. So there's a number of incidents during that time. Um, excuse me, notably the uh, burning of the Ursuline convent. Now, this was a convent in what was then Charlestown. It's now part of Somerville, Mass. Uh, where it was, it was on the hill. And uh, the Ursuline, which is actually a French order of nuns, ran this convent, and they ran a school for girls. And many of the um, kind of elites of Boston society sent their girls there to go to school. Um, not for Catholic religious instruction, but just to get a good education so they could be, you know, good marriage prospects, which is uh, all the, they could do at that time. But some rumors spread around in Boston that one of the girls uh, in there, and I can't forget if it was a student or a novice, but that she was mistreated and ran away and was kind of semi imprisoned there. And the rumor blew up into this. Um, eventually a riot in which mobs of uh, Boston citizens attacked the convent, burned it to the ground. Uh, and this is documented in, in one of my books here. Um, Fire and Roses, uh, the burning of the Charlestown convent. This is 1834. Okay. Um, they also made a uh, car, not a car, a graphic novel of it called uh, Fire on the Memory. Um, and by the way, these, this period of time is chronicled in a couple of books. Uh, the most notable is called The Protestant Crusade, 1800 to 1860. So that is the, uh, the fight to keep uh, the United States Protestant, um, which uh, a lot of folks thought it was in shift or um, Another uh, take on that is called The Brass Knuckle Crusade, because um, uh, this wasn't uh, this wasn't Andy Candy they were playing. There were riots and murders and et cetera. Um, and the next notable incident is in the 1740s, I'll say 1840s, around the 1800s now, 
1844, when there are anti-Catholic riots in Philadelphia, and the church is burned, and there's mobs, and so on. And that's actually one of the scenes that they put on the, on the cover of uh, this book. Um, well, they thought that was a troublesome onslaught of uh, Irish Catholic immigrants. They ain't seen nothing yet, because then the Irish potato famine happens in the, uh, starting in 1845, and many hundreds of thousands of uh, destitute Irish Catholic immigrants arrived in, in the United States, and they are not welcome, and particularly here in Boston, which is still predominantly third in the um, And the, per the, the perceptions of the uh, inadequacies, shall we say, of the Irish immigrants are just things that we've heard and continue to hear about immigrants forever. You know, they're, they're ignorant, they're uneducated, they're immoral, um, they're going to ruin our society, they can never become assimilated, blah, 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 blah. Um, and one of them that we have heard in recent years about immigrants, oh, they're, going to, they're all going to be on welfare, blah, 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 depending on the government. Well, they were saying that about the Irish in the 1840s, as depicted in this uh, cartoon showing a shipload of Irish immigrants, we pass that around, um, a ship that looks like a poorhouse, and it is called the Poorhouse of Galway, as in Ireland is shipping all its poor people here, so we can take care of them instead of, uh, instead of uh, the Irish government, which was the English government, because it was still a colony. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't think about welfare in that period, but it was relief poorhouse, it was a local or state responsibility, not uh, federal in any way, but it was there, it was an issue, and it was something that immigrants were being tagged with as being a problem um, to the society. And that onslaught of immigrants, which uh, in the late 1840s is both the Irish band immigrants as well as a huge number of German immigrants, um, many of whom were coming after the failed revolution of 1848. Um, so Germany, like most of the countries in Europe, were still monarchies um, with kings and emperors or whatever. And there was a small d democratic revolution, which means mostly a middle class revolution, trying to institute some kind of level of democracy. Um, and that's put down and failed. And a lot of the revolutionaries find themselves having to leave and come to the United States. Now, Obviously, both groups are mixed, but on average, the German immigrants at the time are a little better off, and in many cases, are able to have the wherewithal to travel inland. So we end up having these huge German um, enclaves in places like Cincinnati, and St. Louis, and Milwaukee, and Sevier, um, and eventually Chicago, although that's, that's just a cow town at this point. Um, so these become huge centers of German American culture with German languages and public meetings conducted in German, etc. Um, and a lot of Native Americans don't like all that. Um, then you get the Irish famine immigrants coming to Boston and elsewhere, um, where they are destitute, uh, unable to, uh, you know, like, totally inexperienced in in modern industrial work, so uh, they're taking low wage, low paid jobs, and then being accused of all the things I told you of. And what they're both, the Germans and the uh, Irish are accused of, is being uh, heavily, uh, heavy alcohol users. Um, so of course the Irish uh, enclaves and neighborhoods developed a series, developed saloons on every corner, um, which is the one place somebody can go for a little hour and hour after 12 hours of digging ditches. Um, and in German enclaves, there's a great tradition of the Sunday picnic. Um, and of course, the Sunday picnic is a washing beer, which sounds real good to me right now. Um, so the, the alcohol overconsumption is another thing that the immigrants at the time were targeting. With. And because there's so many arriving so suddenly, um, some of the movements that had previously existed, organizations, anti-immigrant organizations, really 
explode in the 1840s, and most notably a group uh, that becomes a political party, um, calling itself the Native American Party, but which has come to be better known as the Know Nothings. And the name Know Nothing is because they were a secret organization. Membership was supposedly kept secret, although it was a poorly kept secret, and almost everybody knew, because almost everybody joined at one point. Um, but they were supposed to, when they were asked about it by a non-member, they were supposed to say, I know them. Um, so that they became the new members. Um, well, under those circumstances, they grew exponentially in the late 1840s, early 1850s, coinciding with um, the partial collapse of the party system, or particularly of the Whig Party. Up until that point, there were two major parties, the Whigs and the Democrats. Um, but under the pressure of the sectional conflict over slavery, you know, run into the Civil War, um, the, the party system breaks down. There are other third and fourth parties started, the Free Soil Party, um, I forget you name another one, you know, the Constitutional Union, the Constitutional Party. Union Party. The Whigs collapse. Um, gradually, the Republicans form. And by 1856, for the first time, they were able to run a candidate uh, for president. But in 1854, 55, we still have this breakdown while the uh, American, uh, Native American or No Nothing Party is growing like mad. And for one year, they take over politics in America. They're elected to majorities in almost every state legislature, every, uh, every governorship. Um, presumably uh, large numbers of Congress, although I don't think they would take a majority. Um, so suddenly this anti-immigrant party is the dominant party in the country. And they probably, if the timing had been different, they probably would have elected a president. Um, but this um, fluorescence of them is so brief, you know, like a year and a half, uh, two at the most, where they're really on, on top of things, and then it kind of declines a little bit, uh, mostly because attention is being focused on the sexual conflict, slavery, and what the hell we're going to do about that. Um, now, the Know Nothings, as, although we may see them as a rather, uh, uh, you know, prejudiced uh, group, they have an interesting set of policy proposals. Um, first of all, they, they do not advocate shutting off immigration, um, probably because no one even conceived of that as a possibility at the time. There's no federal immigration law. Anybody and anybody can come, and they do, and uh, there's no regulation of it. And most people don't want regulation of it because they want the incoming population. That's how the country's going to grow, um, both where we already are, but also growing west, populating territories, territories becoming states the whole country becoming more powerful and prosperous. So people, immigrants are wanted, for the most part, um, except the right immigrants, uh, depending on who's defining who are the right immigrants. Um, so they, the no nothings don't advocate immigration restriction or cutting it off. They do, however, advocate a 21-year waiting period before you can vote, before an immigrant can vote. So after you naturalize and become a citizen, um, we, uh, someone's a citizen, they can vote. They take on all the rights and responsibilities of the citizen. They wanted people to wait 21 years to be able to vote um, because, well, if you're born here, you have to wait 21 years. And your naturalization is effectively your birth as an American, uh, so you have to wait 21 years. Uh, but that's related to another accusation pointed at the immigrants, which is that they were ruining American politics because of uh, you know, machine politics whereby immigrants both were bought um, either flat out with money or with drink or with a job working for the city um, as would become notorious in democratic political machines um, in Boston, New York, uh, Tammany Hall was called in New York. And these political machines which traded favors for votes. Um, favors like a job. And if you're a destitute immigrant and somebody offers you a job, you're going to be grateful and you'll vote for, probably vote for them they want you to vote for. 
but people felt that this was corrupt, you know, buying votes, uh, essentially. So that was one of the major complaints against the immigrants was their dependence on uh, involvement in the machine politics of the time. Um, so 21 years to vote. The other curious uh, policy of the Know Nothings was that they were anti-slavery, uh, which seems odd given that their whole basis for being was on prejudice. Um, but you do have to understand that being anti-slavery back then didn't mean you believed in equal rights for African Americans. What it meant was that you wanted white working class people to have a shot at the jobs that would be taken by slaves if slavery was allowed to grow, um, particularly in the territories in the, that, that were becoming states. So this, the party called the Free Soil Party is for free soil, meaning no slavery in the territories as they become states. But that wasn't because they were inviting free blacks to come up and live there. They wanted the land to be open and available to whites who wanted to move west and start farms and so on. They felt that the average white working class person or farmer couldn't compete with the extremely wealthy planta southern plantation you know, they own hundreds of slaves. They own, they made millions in cotton in the early 20th century, and they wanted to expand. Um, it's one of the reasons we ended up fighting the war with Mexico. So we wanted to expand slavery in Texas. Um, so they, at the very few reasons, for whatever their motivations, they were anti-slavery. Um, questions, anybody? Moving on. Uh, so after that, and after the Know Nothing kind of hysteria winds down, um, nativism doesn't disappear. It's a little bit more in the background, but there's still plenty of anti-Catholic feeling around the country. Um, some of the issues that are contentious include the public schools. Okay, Catholic uh, kids are attending the public schools. And what are they learning in the public schools? They're learning that the Catholic countries are backward and Catholic peoples are su su oh, not suspicious. Anyway, suspect. Suspect. Um, superstitious. That's the word. Catholic teaching is, uh, by, the, by the Protestant majority of mainstream, Catholic teaching is considered superstitious, you know, uh, worshiping saints and, and worshiping statues. That generally don't want to do. Um, and so Catholic kids and, and uh, reciting Protestant versions of prayers in the schools, in the public schools. So naturally, the Catholic parents and communities don't like that. They argue, there's fights back and forth in many places, um, lawsuits, etc. And uh, eventually, the American Catholic Church hierarchy decides. And we are never going to get satisfaction from the American public schools. They're always going to, or at least for the foreseeable future, they're going to be prejudiced against Catholicism and Catholic countries. Um, so that's when the church says, we have to have our own schools. And the policy of the American Catholic Church is parishes should create their own parochial schools. So the kids are going to school in a Catholic environment taught by Catholics and not being told that Catholicism stays. Um, but then the Protestants say, oh no, they're going to their own schools. That's not good. They're not going to become good Americans. They're going to be further indoctrinated into Catholicism and, uh, you know, following orders from Rome. And uh, further illustration of the fear that Rome is coming to take over America is this cartoon by Thomas Nast, who was a very famous cartoonist uh, uh, for a New York paper in the late, uh, mid to late uh, 19th century. Now this cartoon depicts Catholic bishops and you know the, the pointy hats that look like a clamshell, okay? Except the Catholic, Catholic bishops wading ashore with their hats like crocodiles or alligators. Okay, coming to take over America. Um, and this is no obscure thing. I mean, Thomas Nast was a very popular, well known um, cartoonist of the time. Jim Harper's Weekly. Harper's Weekly. Thank you very much. 
uh, a, a very prestigious uh, um, publication. So this was not really fringy to think that the Catholic Church was actually a threat um, to America. And I also have to say, they, they were not, this attitude was not 100% unfounded. Um, because the Catholic Church was having a slow and difficult time accommodating itself to enlightenment values like free thought and individual rights. The Catholic Church had enjoyed uh, a close relationship with monarchies in Europe for hundreds of years. And the onslaught, the oncoming of democracy, individual rights, freedom of religion, freedom of thought, and all that, that didn't sit so well. And in fact, in 1867, the Pope, forget his name, issues a statement um, called the Syllabus of Errors. Um, I don't know if it's a bull or an encyclical or what the hell would he call it, the Syllabus of Errors. And some of the errors that were becoming popular in the world that were you know, freedom of thought, democracy, etc. The Catholic Church still believed there was uh, a natural hierarchy among men and that the lower men should obey the upper men. They were, of course, on top of the heap. Um, so, you know, these ideas about Catholicism weren't totally unfounded. Um, but, of course, you know, the average Irish immigrant coming here isn't coming here to take over America for the Pope. He's just trying to survive. Um, um, meanwhile, out west, you have a huge influx of Chinese immigrants. They begin to come with the um, discovery of gold uh, in California. Like people came from all over the world to try to get rich with the gold discovery in California. Um, there's a lot of conflict in the gold fields of California, and the Chinese uh, miners or would-be miners are discriminated against and chased off their fines and not allowed to legally file their claims for land and so on. But still, they manage somehow to uh, uh, to make some money off gold mining. And in fact, uh, they're so well organized and diligent in their work that sometimes they are able to make money off of claims that had been abandoned by other miners. Because the, the original miner had gotten the easy stuff to find, and then they tried to move on to something richer, but the Chinese would come and still work that and, and enough to make, make a living on it. Um, and then, of course, many are hired to work on the Transcontinental Railroad, famously, um, although they're not allowed to be in the photograph when the two trains meet and they have this bottle of champagne. No Irish, no Chinese in it. Um, but after that, and the gold hysteria is over, uh, people are struggling to make a living, and then the nation goes into a big recession in the 1870s. 1873 it starts, I think. Uh, and of course, in those days, the recessions were called panics. Uh, so it's the panic of 1873. Uh, you probably should still call them panics, because that's what happens. Um, and so there's unemployment everywhere, and people are struggling. And the unemployed white working classes of the West take their frustration and anger out on the Chinese out West. So there's a very large, very uh, virulent and violent movement against the Chinese out West. Chinese must go, they want to ban, they want more restrictive laws on them, etc. And this movement is led by an Irish immigrant worker named Kearney, K-E-A-R-N-E-Y, I think his first name. And he's the leader of this thing. And they are able to convince enough folks throughout the country that this, the, the Chinese should be banned, um, that they passed the first national immigration restriction law in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act. All right, so it's specifically <coughs> racist and this restriction of a particular class of immigrants. Now, the law is targeted towards laborers. Uh, a Chinese merchant or student, who's presumably the son of a wealthy merchant, is still a lot to come, but that's just a handful of people. Basically, Irish immigration is cut off at that point, and that continues for 60 years. We only stopped in the 1940s because China is our ally fighting the Japanese in World War II, and it kind of looks bad if they're uh, uh, have this racist. Uh, anti-immigrant law against, against the Chinese. 
Now, the year before the Chinese Immigration Act passes, so 1881, that is the year when the arrival of French Canadians in New England stirs up enough resentment that the Massachusetts Commissioner of Labor, in his annual report, um, criticizing the arrival of the French Canadians, describes us as the, quote, Chinese of the East. Now, they're about to ban Chinese nationwide, so you know that's not a compliment when they're comparing us to the Chinese. Um, because we will take any job, because we live in enclaves and don't want to assimilate, um, because we move around from job to job, because sometimes we go back home after we've worked enough and um, got screwed enough. Um, so that's, that's how the French Canadians are perceived at first, and that continues for a while. Um, but then come the 1890s, we get this whole new massive wave of immigrants from new sources, from southern and eastern Europe. Um, Italians, Greeks, Poles, Lithuanians, Russians, uh, Eastern European Jews from many of these countries, some folks from the Middle East, of course, in Lawrence. We get a lot of uh, uh, what, what were called, um, ah, we call them Lebanese now, Syrians. They were called Syrians at the time because Lebanon was still part of Syria. Uh, but for the most part, they're Lebanese, and they come to this area and, and others in, in large numbers. Um, so, Naturally, uh, this wave spurs another round of nativism all over the country. There is a group formed in the Midwest called the American Protective Association, and it's basically, you know, keep America Protestant, keep out of all these Catholics and Orthodox Christians and Jews coming from all these places. Um, they were around for a while. They're based in the Midwest, but they did have some meetings here. Um, and Lawrence and the film, I forget. Um, but the big group, the most influential group, anti-immigrant group that forms in the 1890s is called the Immigration Restriction League. And they are based in Boston and led by a bunch of Boston Browns, you know, rich old Yankee families who want to, who have been, you know, rulers of the roost for a long time and they want to stay that way and they want to keep America white and, and Anglo-Saxon and cross. Um, so it's a couple of recent grads at Harvard who start this organization in the 1890s, but they get a lot of support, um, most notably from Henry Cabot Lodge, who's the senior senator from Massachusetts and a very influential senator for decades. Um, and this is his kind of pet project, restricting immigration. Um, and they fight for this for, uh, for quite some time. And uh, you, know, you might think they might be able to pass legislation more easily, but there's a lot of opposition, uh, mainly from industrialists who like the cheap labor. Um, so the business side of the, uh, of the political scene, uh, the pro-business side, kind of wants to keep the gates open. Um, Organized labor, for the most part, is anti-immigrant. And the majority of the organized labor at this time represented under the American Federation of Labor. It represents um, skilled white workers, mostly construction, the trade, the construction trades, and other skilled trades like brewers and bakers and printers and so on. Um, and so. They're against immigration of all these new, you know, relatively unskilled immigrants because it's going to bring down wages and bring down, bring down the country for crying out loud. Um, so the opposition is kind of building through this period and it's beginning to take on some kind of scientific or now we would call it pseudo scientific legitimacy, um, starting with. Uh, Going back to Darwin and the evolution of the species, evolving out of that is an idea called social Darwinism. Now, Darwin's theories are that you know, survival of the fittest. So the species that um, changes in certain ways that are advantageous will survive, and the ones that don't, won't. And people apply this to society and to people, saying, 
well, you know, some cultures are better than others, and that's why they're powerful, and the others are inferior, um, so they need to be uh, controlled or ruled over by the smarter people who happen to be white and Northern Europeans, uh, or white and Northern European extraction. And then, we have the emergence of a scientific version of this, pseudo-scientific version of that, called eugenics which is that the idea that populations can and should be controlled. Um, just like, you know, we've made it and, and created breeds of cattle and dogs, um, we should be doing the same with people. And inferior people shouldn't be allowed to reproduce. Um, and this has a lot of advocates. This is, this is during the progressive movement. And we think of the progressive movement as these liberal reforms to reform capitalism, um, child labor laws, and things like that. But there's some other weird things that come under uh, the progressive movement, um, including this idea of regulating reproduction. Um, so some you know, semi-prominent progressives are actually in favor of uh, eugenics. So all these things come together uh, under a huge commission put together by the federal government to study immigration. Um, I believe it's called the Dillingham Commission? It is. Yeah, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Knowledgeable audience. Um, so they do this exhaustive investigation based on economics and culture and so on, and their recommendation is, oh, guess what? We need to restrict immigration. Um, so the the first federal legislation really restricting uh, immigration broadly. Um, I mean, there had been a couple after the Chinese Exclusion Act. There were laws to uh, prohibit the immigration of uh, the insane or and contract labor um, and something else. Um, but the first really broad restriction on immigration is the literacy test imposed in 1917. So from there on, an immigrant has to prove that they're literate uh, in order to enter the country. Of course, if you're born here, you don't have to be literate, and that's OK. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that begins to put a crimp on immigration, although it's already been stunted a bit by World War I. You know, all that conflict and conflagration, and uh, obviously it puts a real damper on people trying to cross the ocean to get here when they're in German U-boats and ships. Um, so there's very little immigration anyway uh, during that time. But after the war, um, the economy kind of rebounds and immigration is starting to pick up again. But the restrictionists aren't done. So they passed, uh, in 1921, they passed the first quota law, um, which sets quotas on how many people from certain countries can come. And of course, it's more favorable to the Northern Europeans than to anybody else. Uh, and then a much more restrictive quota law in 1924. So from 1924 on, immigration is virtually cut off for the next four decades. Um, there's some exceptions. There's you know uh, uh, some certain refugees from World War II, European refugees from World War II are allowed here. And of course, once the Cold War breaks out, we'll welcome anybody fleeing the communist country. Um, but there's, act, there's very little immigration during that period. One exception, I guess, would be um, Canada and Mexico. Because, to my understanding, the 24 Cobola law did not apply to the Western Hemisphere. Um, so there's still some continuing immigration from Canada and Mexico. Although, uh, it also tends to be limited by the economy. You know, the, the, the biggest pull, fact, pull and push factor in immigration is the state of the economy, whether you have a decent job and a good life where you are, or whether you think you can do better somewhere else. So when the US is in the midst of the Great Depression, not many people are coming here. Um, uh, wherever they're coming from, it's, it's not looking like it's going to be a whole lot better here. And in fact, during the Great Depression, the United States deports a large number of Mexicans from the Southwest on the assumption that a Mexican is not an American citizen, even though Mexicans have been American citizens since we took half of Mexico after the Mexican-American War. You know, the, the original Mexicans didn't cross our border. Our border crossed them 
when we took over Texas and Arizona and Mexico and California. Um, so these are Mexican Americans who are citizens and have been for years. But when they're doing these deportations in the 1930s, they're not that careful about who is and who isn't a citizen. They just put them on buses and trains and ship them down to Mexico to relieve the unemployment, supposedly. Um, now, the change to a less discriminatory immigration system, uh, and, and there are folks at the same time as all these nativists are talking who are you know, saying that immigration is a strength, the United States is a, is, is, is a salad, is a mosaic, is all these things, and all this uh, diversity makes us better and stronger, et cetera. Uh, but one of the notable voices putting forth the pro-immigration argument is John F. Kennedy, um, who publishes three books before he's president. Um, his Harvard thesis, which was why England slept. Um, his best known, which is Proof of Profiles and Courage, uh, which was ghostwritten by which advisor? Uh, Sorensen? Ted Sorensen. Ted Sorensen, yeah. Um, and then a pro-immigration book called A Nation of Immigrants, uh, which is celebrating American immigration history. And of course, it's no coincidence because JFK is an Irish Catholic, and his family came here during and after the potato famine and went through all that. Uh, terrible discrimination and no Irish need apply and all that, and those stories were perpetuated in his family. Um, so he wanted the immigration system to be less race and ethnic based um, and more fair, quote unquote. Now, it, that was one of his policy proposals. It couldn't be passed during his lifetime, but it was passed two years later in 1965. So we have a new Immigration Act passed in 1965, which ends the discriminatory quota system, um, which said that you know, we'll take any English person who wants to come, but we can only have 75 Italians. Um, but when they pass that, there's still a total number limit, um, and it's less than the number of people who want to come here. Uh, so you know, there are still people who have to try to cross undocumented because the number is just so low um, and it's so hard to get permission um, to, to get a visa to, to come from many countries that are obviously uh, people are suffering and they are looking for a better life. Um, but obviously since 65 is why we've seen such uh, change in the makeup of the immigrant population towards Latin America, Asia, and more recently, uh, 